All right, so I'm tweeting out there. Oh, Recorded live. Welcome, everybody. This is Dave. I'm going to be your host for this evening. Um, we're glad you're here. I think we've got a really great uh, layout of some, some information here. And um, I've had some people asking me some questions about all kinds of different things. And so we decided to uh, talk about uh, these topics here tonight. And uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of good information here. We're going to only going to run until 9.30 this night, tonight because we have another uh, call that we have to do. But uh, before we get started, I want to welcome everybody. And I certainly want to welcome all our federal agents. Um, I hope you uh, learned something here tonight, and I hope you'll take some of what we've got here and you'll research it and you'll find out it to be true so that you can you can uh, settle in your own hearts of what you're doing and what's going on because, let's face it, you guys got lied to just like everybody else has. So I want to give a quick disclaimer. You know, we're a group of men and women. We're sovereigns. We're living men and women upon the land, and uh, we operate that way. And, uh, you know, we're not here to argue. We're not here to enter into controversy. We're just sharing information with each other. And we're doing that based on, on our rights to do so. Um, and, you know, we're not, we're not attorneys. We're not going to be giving anybody any legal advice. Uh, we're not going to be giving you any tax advice. So, you know, please don't ask because we're not attorneys. Uh, for God's sakes, we're honest working people. So, um, you know, don't, if you, if you have a question, then what I would recommend, you ask your question in a format that would be, gee, you know, uh, if, if, uh, if this happened to you, what would you do, Dave? Or, you know, if this happened to you, what would you do, John? And so um, um, that's, that's the format, and that's, that's how we like to do things. So with that in mind, um, uh, one of the topics tonight is uh, I've been getting some questions uh, a lot um, and they've asked me about, um, well, these are people that know me, unbeknownst to some of you out there that don't know me as well as, as some others, but my background is my father was, a, was an officer, and uh, by the time I, when I say officer, he was a military officer, and um, by the time I was probably, I don't know, seven or eight years old, I was already on a firing range and a rifle range, and I was being introduced to different types of weapons, um, pistols and rifles and so on. So in and around that, I you know, I was a young kid and I started shooting guns and, and, you know, and I liked it. It was fun. And, you know, my dad would bet once I got, I, I got to be pretty good with the darn things. And my dad used to bet against me and, and his buddies. And so, it, you know, it was, it was a fun and it was a way to bond with my father as well. So, you know, we used it for that, for that purpose as well. So, you know, there's a, there's a real buzz in the air about, you know, what's going on, what's happening. You know, if somebody comes into my house, if there's a home invasion, I mean, who knows what's going on? You know, there's a lot of people today that have been kicked out of their home. Can we, uh, can we get everybody to star six? Would you do us a huge favor? And if you hit star six on your phone, then we can drown out hopefully into the, the other uh, background noise. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So um, um, so you know, I, I, I'm having people uh, ask me questions about what would they – you know, what, if it was you, you know, Dave, and you were going to go protect your family, what would you want? What type of a what type of a weapon or whatever would you would you want in your home? And um, and then the other thing we, I've been asked about is, you know, what's going on with the ammunition? Is there a shortage? Um, you know, uh, is it just a run on ammunition because you know Obama and Clinton are trying to take away our guns? Which, you know, let's face it, um, a lot of politicians on the Democratic side of, uh, um, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll do that. I just got to Skype, and I will talk about that. Um, and you know, they're 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 trying to de-arm us. Well, the biggest problem that 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 any government is going to have if they want to completely, uh, you know, put the people in submission is you got to take their guns away because a well-armed country. I got news for you, it ain't going to happen. Come out to my neck in the woods where I live, and I tell you what, I'm surrounded by hunters, and I'm I'm not only surrounded by guys that 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 have guns, they're damn good at using them. These guys have been hunting since they were little kids. They, you know, they can hit a they can hit a white-tailed deer at 300 yards. So, you know, they're they're talented, and they and they know how to clean them and 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 maintenance them and take care of them and so on. So, you know, I think it's going to be if we give up our guns, we got a problem. So, you know, I think it was uh, it was um, I'm trying to think who was it that said that uh, um, oh, the the actor uh, that 
Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, you, you said if you want my guns, you know, you can come take them out of my cold, dead hands. And Charlton so, Heston. thank you, go Charlton Heston. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so, <clears throat> uh, you know, I would recommend if you're going to buy a weapon, you obviously have a couple of options. You can buy rifle, you can buy pistols. And, uh, you know, if you buy a pistol, um, if it was me, I would not buy a pistol that law enforcement are using the same ammunition. And uh, I think if you'll do a little research, you'll find that a lot of the ammunition that's, that you're having a hard time finding, 9mm, 357, this, kind, this type, is because law enforcement used the same rounds. So there's, um, you know, the police forces are ramping up. Uh, military are also using some of these, these rounds, and they're ramping up too. And um, so if it was me, I think the number one um, weapon in any home would be a pistol grip 12 gauge. And for a lot of reasons. Uh, number one, um, what most people don't realize is that if you've never shot a firearm before, especially a pistol, you can go to a range and you can practice for months and months and months and you can get pretty damn good at hitting a target. The only problem is, is that when you're under attack or something's going on, then uh, you know, there's adrenaline that's kicking in. There's a lot of different things that are happening simultaneously. You've got fear, you've got a whole bunch of things. Well, the next thing you know, if, if your hand starts shaking and you're holding a, a 9 millimeter Glock or a 357 or whatever in your, in your hand, guess what? Uh, the, the, your accuracy will drop by 70%. And first of all, even if you are a good shot with a pistol, uh, and then you add that factor in, it could be very, very difficult to hit your target. And, uh, you know, the, the, the most important form of gun control, in my humble opinion, is make sure you hit what, you aim, what you're aimed at. Um, so with a pistol grip 12 gauge, uh, you know what? You can be shaken, but if you pull the trigger and, it's, and you've got it pointed in the direction of the target, there's a pretty good chance that if you're within 50, 60 yards, you're going to hit your target. No question about it. The other thing that's good, the other thing that's kind of nice about the 12 gauge uh, pistol grip is that um, you can stick it around a corner and you don't have to put your head around the corner. You know, in other words, you don't have to expose um, your, yourself. You could literally just stick it around the corner and, and let the lead fly. The other thing is, is that with a 12 gauge, you don't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't worry about the round going through a wall and hitting a neighbor or hitting uh, a relative. Or, or or anything like that. So, to me, I think it's the universal uh, it's the universal weapon, uh, especially obviously if you're in in, in close quarters. Um, uh, the other thing you may want to consider is a rifle, uh, a long range rifle. And if you're going to get a long range, I wouldn't get anything less than a 30-30. Uh, I wouldn't buy it like an M1 carbine, a 30 caliber, um, pretty small shell, not much over 100 yards. Uh, and if you're going to get a, uh, a you know a long range rifle, I would recommend something in the range of a a 30 30 again or above a 270 a 30 odd six. Um, you probably don't want to go much bigger than a 30 odd six if you get into 300 mags or 308s or you know rifles like that where you can shoot a thousand yards. But the problem is is that you know they will they will they will kick you hard. So um, uh, you know you don't want to be afraid of the weapon. And unless you've been shooting for a long time, um, you know, uh, you, you have a tendency to flinch. People do that aren't used to a kick of a 300 or a 308. Um, so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, that's kind of, uh, you know, my recommendation in terms of uh, home protection. You know, there's other things you can get, too. You know, there's some pretty good mace. Uh, they've got tasers. You have to check your own laws in your own states uh, when it comes to these kind of things. But, uh, you know, I, I, some other people are talking about getting um, a concealed weapon permits. And um, I'm like, I don't quite understand that because the Second Amendment gives you the right to bear arms, period. Um, and <laughs> that's, that's it. What else do you need to know? If I bear an arm, I bear an arm. So <clears throat> do, I need a, uh, do I need a concealed weapon per permit? Well, why? So... You know, one of the challenges that we're facing right now is that uh, they know that they're never going to get, get our guns away from us, so the regulations that you're trying to impose right now is on the ammunition, and that you've got to fill out these cards, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and, 
And then, of course, uh, uh, they want to be able to come into your home anytime they want. And if you don't have the weapons stored correctly, if the ammunition isn't away from the pistol and you have children, I mean, you know, some of the, some of the legislation they're talking about here and, and, you know, the fines and the uh, being, you know, putting you in jail for five years and, you know, all this kind of stuff is absolutely insane. So, you know, it's, it's obviously just a, uh, another, uh, another uh, position and uh, move on the Illuminati and the, and, and the Rothschild cartel uh, to, uh, to take everything you've got. So I think, I think people in this country are, you know, there's, there's, there's enough people in this country that do know what's going on. They are awake. Uh, they're not ignoring the evidence. They're not pretending there's no problems. And uh, they're arming themselves. And uh, I, think, uh, I think a loud and clear message just got sent to Washington um, with regard to uh, people and, um, you know, all the, all the I mean, guns, guns are at an all-time. They're, they're buying guns like they're going out of style. People in this country were buying ammunition like it's going out of style. And let's face it, that's, that's, that's not, a, that's not a, a stupid thing to do by any means. I think it's a real smart because uh, better to have it and not need it than to uh, than to uh, need it and not have it, in my my humble opinion. So, um, so if you have any questions about that, you can Skype us, and uh, you know, if, if you don't know, you know, take a take a trip down to your local gun gun shop. There's a lot of great companies out there. You know, you've got Gander Mountain and Cabela's, and and you've got all these these big. Uh, 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 sporting goods stores that you can go to, and normally the guys behind the counter are they're sharp, they're well trained, and you can go in there and you can kind of, you know, you can tell them, you can tell them what your experience is, what it, you know, what 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 you have, what you don't have, you know, you've heard this, you've heard that. Most of these guys can answer these questions for you, and uh, they can certainly uh, uh, coach you on, uh, you know, what what weapon might be right for you. You know, you might get in there and go, wow, you know, I don't know uh, that 12 gauge. Uh, Pistol grip is too much for me, uh, you know, because it's a 12 gauge. You know, it's going to have a little bit of a kick to it. But by the way, you're not you're, you're holding it differently too. You're not holding it, you know, uh, up to your shoulder where it's kicking you as well. So uh, anyway, that's just my two cents. I think it's a a great weapon inside the home. And uh, you know, by golly, you come in my house and if, and and if I've got that in my hand and you're there to do harm to me and my family, you got a problem. There's one other thing about that about that pistol grip and that is when you cock it the sound that it makes um that is a um that's a universal sound and when you cock that bad boy criminals know that sound <laughs> uh people that are out to do wrongdoing and 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 you know they're there to perform evil you know ways against you man you cock that bad boy and they're going to go they're going to know what that sound is so uh, you, and again, you could be nine years old, or you could be a hundred and, and nine years old, and uh, you know you don't have to be a real good aim. Uh, now, the last time I checked, by the way, when I, you know, some of the, you know, Walmart and uh, Gander Mountain and these places that sell uh, ammunition, um, 12 gauge ammunition, last time I saw, was was in abundance, uh, because again, most people aren't buying. Pistol grip 12 gauges. They're just not doing it. Uh, they're buying, um, you know, nine millimeter Glocks, and they're buying Glocks, and they're buying Smith and Wesson, and they're buying, you know, these kinds of pistols. And so the ammunition is 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 uh, being scooped up by law enforcement and people that are buying these. Um, and uh, again, you know, uh, shotgun shells are 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 in abundance out there, and, and you shouldn't have you shouldn't have any problem whatsoever getting them. So. Um, you know, in terms of the actual, I mean, a 12 gauge is a 12 gauge. So you're buying a 12 gauge, uh, a shot. And if you don't know, you know, you can go in there uh, and you can talk to the people behind the counter because, you know, you want to do that. You want to educate yourself from that standpoint, you know, because you've got all kinds of different, uh, all kinds of different um, uh, 12 gauge. You've got uh, double lot buck and you've got bird shot and there's, you know, there's, there's, there's a few different, there's a few different uh, um, choices for you. But you can go read on the box how many how many pellets or BBs or or uh, you know they're really just little round pieces of steel uh, are in um, each shot. So if you're throwing eight ten shot out there at one time, uh, you know you're you're definitely going to inflict a lot of damage. Uh, it's going to stop them. I'll guarantee you that um, they are not going to keep coming forward. There is no question about it. So 
anyway, and it's good to get out and, you know, again, I think learn and educate yourself. And, and, um, so, um, and, and there's other, again, there's other, you can do Google, you know, again, there's, they've got tasers and they've got pepper sprays and they got all kinds of stuff. But, uh, you know, again, at the end of the day, the nice thing about cocking, in my humble opinion, a 12 gauge is, um, when you cock that bad boy, it might stop right there. That might be all that's needed for you, for the assailant to take off running and realize that uh, you you aren't to be bothered. So that way, there's no you know there's no bloodshed and nobody gets hurt, no blood, no foul, as they say. So um, so that's my two cents. You know that's my story, and I'm and I'm sticking with it. So um, I'm going to kind of move on um, uh, to the next uh, topic. And, um, and the next topic tonight was um, to talk about uh, the swine flu and, uh, you know, whether it's fiction or nonfiction and, you know, what we need to do to protect our families and, uh, you know, um, um, you know, is wearing these little masks, does that help? And, uh, you know, is there, is there certain things or uh, things that I can go out and buy like collodial silver and, and uh, bentonite clay and all these different things that you can take that helps your body uh, you know, fight off whatever it is. You know, what we need to know, I think it's important here, and I just want to, I, I want to tell you this right up front, that there's a guy uh, uh, that um, is going to be uh, hosting um, a call tomorrow. Uh, he only hosted it um, for um, a, a thousand people, and uh, he's, um, he's, he's actually sold tickets, which at the end of the day, you know, I, I don't really have a problem with him selling tickets and, I'll, and I and I say that because this guy has spent a great deal of time and money to travel around the world and um, and bring back just absolutely invaluable uh, uh, you know information. I mean, his study is and he's probably uh, one of the most respected homeopathic healing uh, uh, natural remedy uh, guys on the planet. Uh, his name is Mike Adams, and you can do a Google on him. And uh, I know we've got some people on the call that uh, probably know 10 times more about him than I do. Um, he was turned on to me a couple of years ago, and, and uh, I've uh, read a lot of his stuff, and I'm telling you, this guy rocks. He takes no crap off the FDA. He's attacking them all the time. He's attacking the drug companies. You know, uh, here last year about this time, you know, that vaccination for, for young teenage girls that was supposed to stop, uh, you know, cervical cancer and all that. I mean, that, that is just a freaking joke. Uh, what it's doing to these young girls is just incomprehensible to me how evil these bastards are in, in getting girl, young girls to take this vaccine. So the bottom line is that, you know, we're talking about a swine flu. We're talking about an influenza here. And if you keep your body... Uh, it, it, you know, in, in top shape as best you can and, and let it do what it was designed to do by, by the Lord, um, guess what? You keep your immune system high, um, I think you'll find that, these, uh, that, these, uh, that the swine flu is going to attack, uh, uh, you know, young babies, uh, older people, and people that, don't have, that don't, haven't taken care of themselves. So anyway, what I've decided to do on this is that because Mike's going to have his call tomorrow evening, um, uh, again, uh, he's, there's only a thousand people that can uh, that can come to this call. It costs eighteen dollars, and I'm going to be on it. And I thought what I would do is bring all his information to the call um, uh, next week, uh, you know, on Wednesday. So if any of you would like to go and and attend, then if you'll just go, I think if you just do a Google on Mike Adams, um, I forget his uh, website. Natural but I, news, it's naturalnews.com. Naturalnews.com. And I was just getting ready to say, I'm sure Stephen will come on and tell us because Stephen knows. Uh, and, and, and we actually do have an authority on our phone tonight who knows a lot about healing. Uh, he knows a lot about how to take great care of yourself and, and whole foods and, and um you know, organic foods and, and veggies and fruits and all those wonderful things that the Lord tells us in Scripture to eat and take care of ourselves. So um, uh, I'm, I'm real excited to hear what Mike's got to say about this because I think it's going to be extremely valuable. Um, the one thing that I will talk about tonight with regard to that is that, you know, you've got to be really careful 
folks, about what you tell yourself and what you allow yourself to believe because your belief system can make or break you. Um, and you also have to be a really good, you have to be a really good gatekeeper. And that, and again, that's, that's based on scripture. The Lord tells you, you got to be careful what you allow through your eyes. You got to be careful what you put across, what goes across your, your lips. And you have to be very, very careful about what you listen to. And, um, I, a few years ago, I, I attended a, a, a an event, uh, in Hawaii. <clears throat> it was called Life Mastery. It was back in 1990. 1997, I believe, and Deepak Chopra. It was a 10-day event, and Deepak Chopra was there. If you don't know who Deepak Chopra is, he's, he was uh, head of medicine at, I think, at John Hopkins. And uh, he woke up one day and said that he was just a glorified drug pusher. And he, he, he woke up and he said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I am not going to treat the symptom because we are not curing people today. It's not working. Western medicine is failing. So he left, he quit, and he walked away. And then, you know, he's written, he's written a lot of books. Um, and one of them is, I think it was called Ageless Mind, Timeless Body. And so what, what he realized, and a lot of people know this, and that is um, <clears throat> that you can, <clears throat> your bo- our body re- reproduces all the cells at the cellular level, you know, every couple of days, every couple of weeks, every couple of months. It depends on the organ. It depends on whatever. But we're making new skin, you know, new kidneys, new heart, brain cells, everything. So what Deepak was trying to figure out is that, well, if, if our body makes all these new cells all the time, why does it make bad cells? In other words, if somebody has cancer, then why does it reproduce cancer cells? And what he's, what, basically what he's come, come to believe is that it comes around belief system. Uh, one, of my, uh, one of my best friends had attended this Life Mystery event one time, and he had uh, listened to Deepak, and he'd also listened to Dr. Norman Cousins. And Dr. Norman Cousins the, is the guy that cured himself with laughter. He cured himself with endorphins. In fact, you can even get endorphin shots today. I think they're about, they were $5,000 10 years ago. They're probably triple that now. So he, you know, he, he had just learned that. Well, he came home from Life Mastery. He was coming in his front door because the event was in Hawaii, and he lived in California. And um, his phone was ringing, and he didn't get to it at the time, and it went to his, uh, his answering machine. So that tells you how old this story is because he had an actual – there's these little devices, and they had little recordings in them, and you pushed buttons, and you, <laughs> and you had to play them back. And, yeah, they're called the answering machines. I think you can see them now in the Smithsonian. And so, anyway, uh, his sister had left him a message and said that his mom was really sick, and he needed to come quick. So he jumped in his car, and he drove about, I think it was six or seven hours to the hospital, and as soon as he got there, a, a, a short time later, the doctor walked out uh, who was operating on his mother, and he had blood on, his, on, his, on, on the front of him, and uh, he recognized who this guy was, um, or at least he thought he was, and he went up and said, are you Joseph? And he said, yes, and he said, well, listen, I've got some bad news. I just operated on your mother, and we took a grapefruit-sized tumor out of your mother's stomach. Uh, and I'm, and I hate to have to tell you this, but she's got about three months to live. So you need to start to get her affairs in order. Well, Joseph immediately said, well, look, doc, you know, listen, I appreciate your diagnosis, but I, I don't accept your verdict. You know, you don't know that she's going to live three months. And he goes, Joseph, yes, I do. I do this every day. I've been doing this for 20 years. You know, it's my job to tell your mother that she's got, you know, only a couple months to live. And he, and Joseph said, bullshit. No, you don't. You have no right to play God. Listen, you can tell her she's sick. You can tell her she has cancer. You can tell her a whole bunch of things, but don't give her a death sentence. You have no right to do that. Well, the reason he was talking about the death sentence, because Deepak Chopra had just taught him in the seminar that the statistics show that when a doctor tells a patient that they only have X amount of time to live, 95 90 to 95 percent of the time, they die within 24 to 48 hours of that sentence or the time that they're given. So it's just absolutely phenomenal. So Joseph said, listen, I don't want you to tell that to my mother. You don't have the right to. So they got into kind of a heated and disputed argument about it, and and the doctor said he was going to tell him. Well, Joseph said, if you tell my mother that, I'm going to break your freaking neck. Well, the doctor called security. They escorted him from the hospital. But the bottom line was, 
he was able to make sure that the doctor never told his mother. He literally went out and bought a VCR, went back to his mother's room, and started showing her funny movies. In fact, the first movie he showed her was Tom Hanks, uh, where he buys that house and everything goes wrong. Uh, what's it called? The Money Pit. And so there's his mom who's been cut from the, you know, her neck almost all the way you know, below her belly button and opened her up like a watermelon, laughing, popping the staples in the, in the, or the, uh, the stitches. You know. And here's, here's what's interesting. His mother lived another 11 and a half years. So if you don't think there's power in suggestion and there's not, and there's not incredible power in, in intention, there really is. Because the bottom line is that if you believe that you can or you believe that you can't, you're right. So the only reason I went into that story, you guys, is I want you to be really careful what you listen to on the media. Because I can tell you that 99% of what you're going to hear there is probably full-on crap. Because let's face it, who owns the media? Who owns almost every media source on this planet? The Rothschild cartel. So they're telling you what they want to tell you. Now, I know there are a couple of good programs out there, and it seems like there are a couple of good reporters uh, that are really trying to get people the, the truth. Uh, you know, Lou Dobbs seems to want to you know, tell the truth, and he seems to be hammering people on a regular basis. I think Glenn Beck, is, uh, he's probably uh, he's a pretty, uh, he's a pretty uh, spunky guy. And uh, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's putting some, some good information out there, but I think even Glenn is holding back because I'm sure he's probably already had some death threats. And he's a family man, so, you know, he can't risk his family. But I do commend him because he does, he does put out some, some, pretty good, um, some pretty good information. So, you know, for me, I believe half of what I see and less of what I hear, unless I, unless I know the source really, really well. Um, so, you know, that, that having been said, um, you know, next week um, we should have some really, really um, great information, uh, information we can trust um, and information that we can uh, uh, not only use for our own families, I think you can share it with uh, your, your family and your neighbors and so on and, and uh, really uh, uh, be careful about, uh, you know, what's going on out there with this whole um, swine flu um, um, situation. Uh, there's also evidence, uh, I'm reading already, that uh, the swine flu was uh, created in a laboratory. So, you know, that, that may be the case. I, I, don't, I don't have, you know, 100% confirmation of that, um, but again, I'm going to be working on it because I want to make sure that when we come back to the table here with this information uh, that it's, uh, you know, that it's as accurate um, as, as it can be. And, you know, and for the record, you guys, listen, we come to this uh, um, um, this a forum, and uh, you know we, we share information with each other. But uh, you know, um, if you hear something on this sh on this show, and um, you think you want to do it just because somebody else did it, well, then you know what? Take responsibility for it. We're not uh, um, we're not um, you know we're not telling you to do anything here. Uh, if you do something, you're on your own, um, and you better do your research. And you better not point a finger at someone else and go, well, you know, I did it because that guy over there told me to do it. I got news for you. That's crap. That's absolutely horse crap. So if that's your mindset and that's what you're going to do, you, be you better go into any remedy with clean hands. And you also better go into your own remedy um, uh, uh, knowing how to defend it. Because if you don't and you're relying on other people to get you the information and then you want to turn around and blame someone else, I got news for you. There is no other way to dishonor yourself quicker that I know of than, than to do something like that. And we hear about it, uh, you know, um, all the time. So, you know, that's, um, that's, how to, that's how to be an honorable creditor. That's, <laughs> that's how to move about the country um, um, as, um, as a creditor and as a sovereign man uh, who's living upon the land. Um, one of the other things we wanted to talk about tonight, and I want to uh, plant um, a seed with you out there that you can go uh, do a Google on this, and I think there's about a 54 or 53-minute um, video out there by a guy by the name of John Harris, and it's H-A-R-R-I-S. And um, this guy, uh, he's, he's a Brit, and uh, the video that you're going to see is shot um, in, uh, in England. 
And uh, this guy does a phenomenal job of explaining uh, the difference between the living man and the fiction. And he does a fabulous job of explaining. And of course, over there, he's talking about parliament rather than talking over here, which would we call it something else. What do we call it? Well, we call it Congress. So, but the point is, is that he brings out some really great um, um, information, uh, you know, with regard to um, the, um, you know, how they how they've set everything up and how, um, um, I mean, they, you know, he explains everything when it comes to um, a, a statue versus a law, um, and what and what the and what the difference is. So. Hey. Um, yes. You want to make sure that people know it. John Harris, and they put in it's an like a n illusion. Because if they put in just John Harris, they're going to be a lot. Of I, I got oh. it. Uh, my my third uh, result, Steve, was it's a it's an illusion with just John Harris in there. In my just John Harris. It's an it's an illusion, and you'll it, it will say BBC TV. You can also get it at video.google.com. And you want to watch the one that's 53 minutes. I think they broke it down into five separate videos, yeah, and that's you really want to just – go ahead. That's on YouTube, but if you go to video.google.com, it's the whole 53-minute one. Okay, great. Um, and, um, again, it, it's, it's, it's really phenomenal. In, in fact, um, I had my, uh, my – well, he's soon to be um, – 16, but uh, we homeschool, <clears throat> and, the, and uh, I had my son watch it the other day as part of his uh, as part of his school, and he loved it. I mean, he really loved it. I mean, and he got it. Um, and um, you know, it's 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 really cool. Um, so anyway, um, in there, you know, one of the things that he talks about, he very again, he articulates extremely well. Um, and, and piecing the entire structure um, together uh, in terms of, you know, connecting all the dots with this stuff. And if you're a little unclear about, well, you know, I don't, I don't understand, you know, how, what, what, what is the fiction? How do they turn me into a fiction? What did they do? I mean, I, I'm a living man, but, you know, again, he does, a, he does a phenomenal job. And what's really great is that he gives you – there's a very powerful example. There's a video that they show you of two London police officers who try to come against a man. And even though this guy doesn't know all the language and all the lingo, he, he knows enough how to ask enough questions to get the police officers to leave and go away. And so they they try to um, they try to get him into controversy, and they try to get him to answer all their questions, and he doesn't do it. And again, he he's an he's an incompetent competent, meaning that he doesn't know that he knows. And so he uh, uh, it's really great. I think you I think you really really like it. And, you know, I don't know how many of you have, on the call have ever heard the, uh, the story about, you know, what's screw to tell. I'll tell you the what screw to turn. Um, I'll tell you the quick version. It's uh, years ago Federal, when Federal Express was created, Fred Smith created this unbelievable – I mean, his belief system was, wow, you know, we can get a letter from one location uh, in the world to somewhere else in the world. So they – the, the system they set up at Federal Express was this huge conveyor belt hydraulic delivery system and electrical, and it was just a, you know, it was an engineering uh, marvel. <clears throat> so Fred's told if the system ever goes down, call this guy. Well, he calls this guy. This guy's name's Marvin, and uh, Marvin's like, hey, you know, he's a real old time kind of guy in Tennessee, and and sure enough, he calls him, and Fred's out of his mind because the system goes down, and he says if the system over is down, call Marvin. So he does. Well, long story short, Marvin shows up, and he's an old guy, and, uh, you know, he's real laid back, and he's kind of slow talking, and he kind of acts like he's dumb, and, uh, but he's not. You know, I mean, he's a brilliant guy, apparently. And anyway, so, but Fred needs this thing fixed. Well, anyway, he, he escorts him into the, into, the, into the warehouse, 
and there's this huge electrical panel in the middle of the room and 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 Marvin says take me to the electrical panel and so they take him to the electrical panel and of course Fred's got you know a couple people with him he's got his PA and he's got his his foreman and some other people with him and and so you know Fred's losing thousands of dollars per minute and he's just freaking out so and he you know they're kind of like and you know well uh have you been here before well no but I, you know I should be able to figure it out and so anyway they take him to the electrical panel and, they, and you open up this big door and it's huge I mean it's this huge electrical panel with all these wires coming in and Marvin kind of looks at it and says boy look at all them wires boy I've, I've never seen so many wires in my whole life well you know Fred's like oh my god I mean what have I got myself into and so uh, you know and then he kind of Fred kind of or Marvin kind of looks at it and goes, gosh, I wonder. And he, and he looks in, and there's another little panel inside this panel, and he opens that up, and, uh, <clears throat> and he takes a, he's got a little pocket screwdriver holder, and he pulls a little screwdriver out of his pocket, and he, he, he's looking around going, hmm, and he's making kind of funny noises, and, of course, all these guys are looking at each other like, you know, we're, we're out of business. You know, <laughs> it's over. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so he takes his pocket screwdriver, he sticks it in there, he finds a screw, he turns it about a half turn to the right, and sure enough, the whole system comes back up and starts running. Well, Fred's out of his mind. He's, he's like, oh, my God, Marvin, thank you, thank you, thank you. You have no idea how much I appreciate you. Listen, we want to pay you right now. In fact, I've got cash upstairs. How much do I owe you? And Marvin looks at him and says, $5,000. <laughs> and Fred looks back at him and says, five thousand dollars you were here 15 minutes uh you turn one screw and it's five thousand dollars and marvin says yes sir that's my fee so you know fred's a pretty smart guy he's a brilliant businessman he says well gee marvin would you mind giving me an itemized bill and marvin's like well no sir not at all uh do you have a piece of paper and a pencil so his assistant hands him a clipboard and Marvin takes it, he starts writing on it, turns around, hands the clipboard back to Fred. And Fred looks at it and he goes, looks at his PA and he goes, go upstairs and get me $5,000 in cash. So what did it say on the, on, the, on the piece of paper? Turning screw, $1. Knowing what screw to turn, 4999 And, you know, I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. That's what you need to do. We all need to be Marvins. We need to know what screw to turn. Or in this case, you know, what's our answer? Or what's our question? Because if a cop comes up to you and he asks you, I mean, think about it. If, if you get pulled over and you pull over under threat of arrest or, or bodily harm, what does the cop do when he walks up to the car? He's going to ask you, one of two or three or four questions. One, do you know why I pulled you over? <clears throat> two, do you know how fast you were going? Or maybe he'll just go right for the kill and say, I need to see your driver's license and registration. What is he trying to establish? And, be, and, and as you think about that, what's the difference between a policeman and a police officer? Well, a police officer is a fiction. The police officer is an employee of the corporation. What are employees of the corporation supposed to do? They're supposed to create profit for the corporation. Now, if you don't know this already, then this is great for all you federal agents out there. Go look up any court in America. It's got a Dun & Bradstreet rating. It's a business. It's a corporation. So corporate directors and corporate employees, by the way, that's why all you federal agents out there, that's what the IRS tax law says. You have to pay taxes because you work for the corporation. doesn't say anything about wages for living souls. And that's why, you know, if you watch the movie from uh, Freedom to Fascism, uh, Aaron Russo, 
went out and did a movie on the whole thing, trying to trying to see where the law was that governed the IRS to make people pay taxes. Look, the bottom line is, regardless whether you pay your taxes or not, I'm not telling you I'm not telling you what to do here. I'm not suggesting anything about your taxes. That's a prayerful decision. You've got to decide how you want to deal with the IRS. But here's the bottom line: they are a foreign corporation. That's a fact. And and the absolute bottom line is there's no law. And that's why many IRS agents have quit and left because their conscience was killing them. And they said, how can I go out and destroy people's lives when there's no law? So the bottom line is there's no law. So, you know, when a cop approaches you, then you need to know who he is. What's he doing? Because if you start answering his questions, guess what he's trying to do? He's trying to get jurisdiction over you. Because if you watch any of your cop shows, go watch them. Go watch some of these cop shows and become a student studying the behavior of these guys and understand their intent. See what they're trying to do. They're trying to get you to be First of all, they're, they're treating you like you're subservient, like they have dominion over you. They're a, they're a public servant. They work for you. Now, whether, where you are in Scripture, if, if you're a man of God and you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior and he went to the cross and he zero-balanced your account spiritually, then if you read a little further in Scripture, you'll find out that you're a king. And if you're a king, then you better darn well act like one. So how many, how many, you know, men or women in the king's kingdom would walk up and demand that the king tell him something? Uh, I don't think so. I think probably the king would turn to one of his guards and say, take that guy out there and behead him. Well, just like that. So, again, when an when a, when a, when a officer approaches you, you need to calm down and relax. And have and know what screw to turn, or in this in this case, know what question to ask. Well, I first want to know who you are. I will tell you that I was in court here not too not too long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, and I went in to have some fun. Now you probably think I'm whacked, but I didn't have to go, and I went. And when they called my case, uh, first of all, when I got to the court, uh, the judge wasn't there. He was not physically in the courtroom. Now, what they were doing is they were setting up this new video conference uh, system, and the judge was in another city in another county in the same state, and they were doing video con conferencing. And I'm thinking, well, this is going to be fun. So they called my name, and um, the judge tried to say that I was pro se. Well, I very quickly corrected him because, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, you're not pro se. Go look it up. You are sui juris. Don't ever forget that. So when, I, when, when it came time for them to call my name, I wanted to know who he was. If you go to court and the judge calls your name, you better ask him who he is. That should be the first question you ask him because don't you want to know who he is? I mean, if somebody approached you on the street and you asked you, hey, um, I've got some radios over here. They're brand new. Would you like to buy a couple of them? You might want to ask, well, what's your name? Well, believe me, you're there to do commerce. You're there because there's a financial transaction getting ready to take place. So, you know, my first question was, well, who are you? And he said, he, he said, the court will tell you. Or, no, I'm sorry. He said, my clerk will tell you. And I said, I didn't ask your clerk. I asked you, what's your name? Well, after we got around finding out who his name was, the first thing I did, um, before I even answered my name, I objected. Why? Because he's not physically there in the courtroom. So as far as I was concerned, anything that happened after that was ultra virus. So I then went into my name. And I took my right hand, and I raised it in the air. And I said, um, my, my mother named me David. And that's the family of, you use your last name. And I'm the, I, and I'm the first in line, paramount, secure party creditor for the debtor. 
Then I waited a couple seconds, and then I put my hand down. I looked to the I looked to the right, I looked to the left, and I said, "Are there any objections about what I just said?" Waited a couple seconds. Nobody said anything, and then I said, "Let the record show that I am who I say that I am." And I said that with authority, like a king. I I acted like a king, and I spoke as a king. And when I and I say that, I mean a king in the Lord's army. And that's when the games began. <laughs> um, and at that point, it, it, I, you know, you hear that story about if you buy a book, it's fourteen ninety five, and you use your Mastercard and and then you buy lunch, and it's uh, you know 16.95 on Mastercard, and uh, you know to see something funny happen is priceless. Uh, you guys would have, I mean, you'd pay you'd pay a hundred dollars right now, Federal Reserve note. Now you might even pay it in silver to have seen the look on that judge's face when I told him that I was the first in line Paramount Secure Party creditor for the debtor, and then when I closed the deal by saying. Is there any objections? And let the and let the record show that I am who that I say that I am. He was looking at me like, um, I don't want to deal with this guy. Why? Well, why would he? He he was he didn't like the light that I shined on him. He didn't like that I was standing in the truth. What happens when you turn a light on a cockroach? What happens when you turn a light on a rat? Guess what? They don't like the light, and they run. He didn't like it. Um, and um, I will tell you then, I also played a card, and, I, and I'm not telling you to do this by any stretch of the imagination, especially if you don't understand what I'm, what I'm about to say, but I demanded to see the ratification of commencement. Well, you would have thought that, you, I mean, the look on that judge's face, I mean, I literally thought, his mouth, his mouth opened, and he was standing. He was sitting there with his mouth open, not having a a um, an idea at all what to say. Bottom line was, I finished what I had to say and do, and I walked out of the courtroom because my business was finished. Um, and you know, it was it was really a beautiful thing. It's not the first time I've been in court. Uh, it's not the first time that a judge looked at me and asked my name, and I look him in the face back and said, who are you? And he told me his name. And the attorney stood up at the same time. And I pointed, I pointed a finger at the attorney and said, who's that? And the attorney acted like a little kid in a, in a sandbox. As if to say, you know, he looked at me and he looked back at the judge and he looked at me and he looked back at the judge and like he didn't know what to do. And so the judge looked at him and said, tell him your name. And he told me his name. And then I asked him if he had a certificate of appearance to be there today. Well, I got one of those looks again, like, you know, with a doe with the headlights on him. So uh, I'm sharing I'm sharing that with you is only because, again, it comes down to knowing what to ask. And if, you, and if you never learn anything on this call other than this one very important, critical distinction about the difference between a creditor and a debtor. Debtors testify. Creditors ask questions. Their whole job is no different than almost a martial artist, and that is to keep you off balance. And if you stay balanced and you stay focused and you ask questions, then you will more than likely stay out of hot water. Because where people get into trouble is that the judge is trying to draw you into controversy. That's his job. Why do attorneys argue? That's all they do. Um, I, somebody sent me an email here uh, the other day on, uh, t on uh, the, the gal in California that did the OIDs, uh, Teresa, and, the, and her company. 
and um, I guess it's on the Treasury website, but they actually have the, the case, the, the case, and it's filed, and you can go read it by the attorney that, that filed the case. And you, you, you only have to read the first three lines of the attorney's, up in the top left-hand corner, it gives the attorney's information. And guess what the first thing it says about the attorney? He is the acting attorney for the U.S. Treasury. Hello? Anybody know the difference between a fiction and a nonfiction in a book? I mean, he's acting. He's telling you right there that what he's doing. Then the next line, guess what it says about him? It says that he's a member, and I believe it was, well, which bar was it? My mother always told me to stay out of a bars. You get in trouble. Uh, a lot of truth to that. Uh, oh, I think it was the Iowa, Iowa bar. A member of the bar. Well, most people moving about the country today think that a, an attorney, an attorney on me, needs a license. Um, I remember I was having a conversation with a, a buddy of mine that, who is just freaking brilliant. And uh, his name's Michael. We call him MJ for short. And um, he was in court one time, I believe, and the judge, he was helping somebody. And, and the judge asked Michael if he was an attorney. And, he's, and I think Michael said, well, what kind? And, he, and the judge said, an attorney at law. Michael said, no. I'm an attorney in fact. And he said, do you, have a, do you have a license to practice law? And Michael said, no, and you don't either. Show me mine and I'll show me, show me, show me yours and I'll show you mine. So, you know, so many people today, unfortunately, are, are making decisions out of inspiration or desperation. And, you know, they're, they're looking at losing their house, and they're looking at being foreclosed on and, and losing that house, <clears throat> and they have no, no clue how to go in there and defend themselves. But, you know, things are changing. Um, remedies are coming together. Um, you know, there's only two emotions, <laughs> fear and love. And if you're coming from a place of fear, um, I, I just I doubt very seriously whether you're going to whether you're going to um, get the outcome that you want. But I will tell you, if you're on this call and you're not working with other people, and, because I'll tell you something, together we stand, divided we fall. And there's, there's, some, there's some information that's coming together these days uh, that's, uh, that's working. Um, you know, it, it, I, I'm in Virginia, and there's a, there's a statue in Virginia that, that says – that the courts can have, um, they don't need a note to go to foreclosure. What? Well, wait a minute. They've just defied every honorable position that they could ever have. Because if there's no note, well, if you know anything about contract law, if you enter into an agreement with somebody, then does, does there not have to be equal consideration on both parts? In other words, if, if I got into a contract with any of you tonight, which I am, because we put out an email and said, we're going to come and have a little meeting tonight. We're going to talk about some things. We're going to share some ideas and some concepts with you. Uh, and you agreed to come. So, I mean, you, could, you have contracts constantly. Everything, every time, almost every time you open your mouth, it's contract. Um, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're driving down the road and your spouse calls you and says, honey, would you stop and pick up some milk on the way home? Is that a contract? And if you agree to do it? Well, sure. Absolutely. So if you go to a, a yard sale and you're going to buy something, um, aren't you entering into a contract when you agree to buy something from somebody? Or if you agree to sell it to somebody, you make them an offer, they accept it or they reject it. And then they, they, you may get to a point where they accept it. So you had consideration on the buyer. You had consideration on the seller. You agreed, and you came together, and, and you exchanged services. Well, isn't that what you're doing with a bank? See, here's what a lot of people don't realize. And, again, I want to credit Michael for giving clarity to a lot of us about this. 
And that is people say, well, there's fraud in that note, and there's fraud in the contract, and there's, uh, there's confessed judgment. And, you know, they didn't tell me that I was entering into a financial uh, uh, investment contract. You know, it was supposed to be a real estate contract, and, you know, and I'm really the lender and the creditor, and the money comes for me, and yeah, 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 all that's true. Yeah, oh, yeah, we get that. But where does the fraud begin? The fraud begins in the inducement. The fraud begins in the inducement. And for a state in this country or any, anybody that's involved in law to say, oh, we don't need a note, then, I mean, think about it. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be a law merchant. You don't have to be uh, a paralegal. You don't have to be any of that. I mean, you just know downright that is freaking wrong. So screw you, ladies and gentlemen of America. I'm a banker, and I'm going to get that law passed so I can go in and totally destroy your nation. Destroy it. Let's take Deutsche Bank. I love to pick on Deutsche. Why? Because if you do a little research, you'll find out that, that they were the main financer of the Holocaust. Now, here's what's interesting. Look at how many Jewish law firms are representing Deutsche Bank. What? Are you kidding me? I mean, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. How do these people go home and sleep at night and look at their families and pretend that they love them and that they care about them? If you're a federal agent and you're on this call tonight, guys, go research this. Please come back and tell me why it's okay that the Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express and that they tricked Congress in 1923 during the holiday season to put the Federal Reserve Act into effect. Please explain to me why it was okay for Roosevelt in 1933 to tell your great-great-grandparents to bring in all their gold or you're going to prison and a $10,000 fine. $10,000 in 1933? Imagine how much that is today. 1913, Dave. No, no, no. The Federal Reserve Act started in 1913, was signed into law in 1923. No, I'm talking about when Roosevelt called in the gold, when they put the posters in the post office telling everybody, by the way, they didn't have email and fax machines and, and, and communication, so everybody went down to the post office every day back then, and the, and the poster was in the, was in the post office when Roosevelt told all the people to bring in their gold or you're going to jail. And look, at, and look what it says on the poster. You can Google it. You can go Google it, and you can see the actual poster that was put into the, into the post offices. And it says right there, you have to bring it to a Federal Reserve Bank. Well, why not just take the gold out of your pocket, walk up, and hand it to David Rockefeller? There's no difference. So under threat of arrest, they collapse the financial system in America. And if you're a federal agent and you don't understand what happens when you sign a mortgage, because they lied to your ass as well. They told you the same crap in school that they told us. Which brings up a whole other point. Why do we lie to our children? And guys, let me raise my hand high in the air and take full responsibility for lying to my kids. I did the same thing. And I was, you know, I believed in God back there, but I, you know what? I was a, I was a young Christian, and I was naive, and, you know, I rationalized my bullshit. Because when I did it, I knew it was wrong. Why? Because the Lord has written the truth on our hearts. So the first time I told my kids that there was a tooth fairy, um, why couldn't I just told my kids that, hey, oh, you lost a tooth, son? You know what? Tell you what dad's going to do. Give me that tooth, and uh, I'm going to give you a buck. <laughs> we'll go get an ice cream. And the whole idea behind it was to make it so the kids would pull their teeth out and not, you know, let their set in their set in, it, in its mouth and rot and do whatever and cause bacteria. Uh, and then what's the next big lie? Well, I don't know. Probably the Easter Bunny, you know, and, and that's, that's one that really gets my goat because it takes away, I call it the Mark Furman um, uh, distraction. Um, um, and because what do we do? We're getting away from the event that happened with Christ, and let's make it about coloring Easter eggs and uh, wearing pretty pastel colors. 
and making it a commercial affair by buying candy and those little funny little bunny rabbits uh, that are uh, made out of marshmallow. Um, and then, of course, you know, let's go to Christmas and let's tell, let's 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 say there's a Santa Claus. Oh, and by the way, let's really get satanic on uh, in in October and let's uh, all put funny little masks on our kids and take them around and get candy and uh, celebrate um, Halloween, which is if you do a little research about that, it doesn't get any more satanic than that. Pretty evil stuff going on. And then we'll tell you what, once the kids get to school, we'll start lying to them there too. Uh, let's tell them Christopher Columbus discovered America. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, how can you discover America when the Indians were already here? And on and on and on and on and on. Go read some of your uh, textbooks. Look at your science book and, and uh, maybe your history book and some of your other books. Uh, they'll, there's about, oh, anywhere between 10 to 20 different um, timelines on how old the planet is. And you can hear anything from 370 billion uh, to 320 million. Well, Scripture says it's a few thousand years old. What are we, 7,000 years old? Um, so, you know, um, you know, and it goes on and on and on. And again, you can train yourself to have impeccable sensory acuity to noticing these things. And so as we get a little older, then, they'll, well, we'll just tell them that the Federal Reserve is federal. Now, some people might go, well, it doesn't make any difference. What? Are you kidding me? I mean, you know, and here's an interesting thing, and I'm hearing this in a lot of arenas right now, and I'm also hearing that this is permeating throughout all federal agencies. These guys, these men and women can feel something's really, really wrong. They know it. Why? Because the frequency of the evil doing is permeating around the planet, and it can be felt. But the interesting dynamic that's going on with that is people are being educated and going, hmm, uh, you know, I, this ain't right. My kids and my grandkids are going to grow up here. You know, if you're an FBI agent or a CID or you're a Treasury agent and you're out there hammering people right now for OIDs, you know what? You've got a problem because what those people are doing is in your own manual. You better go look at your own 1212. You better go read there that it says fill out a Schedule B. And if the bank doesn't report the transaction, you're responsible for doing it. And by not reporting it, guess what? You're committing a crime. So the fact of the matter is that when people sign the mortgage, guess what? Well, go look at your own TT&L system inside your own system and go research where that money came from. It came from Treasury. And then they gave it to the bank. And it was your signature, because they, they lied to your ass, too. They stole it from you, Mr. FBI agent or CID agent. You're the creditor. You're the lender. If you think that the bank took money out of their vault and transferred it to Washington Mutual or to somewhere else to pay the loan, you are so far off base, it's unbelievable. It, uh, I, you know, I can tell you, Monty Hall, and let's make a deal. Tell him what he didn't win, Bob. Tell him what's not behind door number three. Number two, the fact is, is that that whole transaction set up, and again, the fraud was in the inducement, because you didn't enter into a real estate transaction. You entered into a financial investment. They took your bonded promissory note, which the judges won't allow back in the, uh, in the courtroom. Why? Well, you, 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 you think? Let's see. Uh, I think that would uh, kind of... Uh, 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 destroy our dog and pony show here. So we can't let the notes come back into the courtroom. So we better get a law in place where, oh, no, man, we can't have those notes. Well, no note, no proof. So it gets back to what we said earlier. There's equal consideration. What banker signed that note? Did he sign it? You signed it. So if he didn't sign it, is there a contract? Tell him, what he, tell him the truth, Bob. Open up door number two. What does it say? Nope. There's no contract. So no wonder they don't want it back in court. Man, how'd you like to get in front of about 100 judges and have this little discussion? Or a, a couple thousand attorneys? You lying, cheating dogs? You can't handle the truth. You have to sit there and take lies, deception, and cheat and destroy people's lives. 
And, and people wonder why the saying, you know, uh, what's 500, 500 lawyers at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean? It's a great start. But you know what, guys? We're Christian men and women, and we, come and we operate from truth and justice. So guess what? Let's educate them. You know, there's an old saying in AA, I love it. When you come in the first time, you're a victim. But when, if you go back out and start drinking, and then you come back to AA for help, now you've become a volunteer because you knew you didn't have to do that. Because the great thing about AA is that the first thing they'll teach you is that you don't have to drink anymore. You don't have to do that. You can live one day at a time. And if you do what we've done, you'll achieve sobriety. Now, I know there's some discussions about identity and saying that you're an alcoholic. My take on that is I don't care if you call yourself, you know, Mickey Mouse screwball alcoholic dumbass. If you're, if you're not drinking every day and you're not destroying your life and the people around you and you're starting to live a better life and you're starting to live a more spiritual life and you're certainly uh, becoming closer to God or at least a power greater than you, then guess what? I, I see that's a greater good. So the, so the bottom line is that we need to educate these people. And the best way we can educate them is put the truth on the table in front of them just like we are with this forum. I hope we get tons of federal agents on this call. I hope we get judges. Because guess what, guys? It's got to stop. Because you're destroying the fiber where your children and your grandchildren are going to live. And you ain't going to be there to protect them, dumbass. So let these guys, let these rogue agents go out and start destroying your family's members' lives. What are you going to do then? What are you going to do when your aunts and uncles and cousins and kids and grandkids learn the truth about... Um, a financial transaction in this country and where money comes from and what banks are really doing. What are you going to do then? Continue to deny it? And I, and I love this part when they say crap like, well, I'm only doing my job. Well, that's horse shit. What a cop out. What a cowardly bastard you are. Because that's the same crap they told they used in Nazi Germany when they were dragging Jews to the oven, screaming and yelling. No, I'm just doing my job. Yep, that's what I'm doing. Got to get my benefits. I want to make sure I get my mental and my dental plan. That's, you know what? You make me sick. You're disgusting. You're everything Thomas Jefferson and, the, and Ben Franklin and the great founders of this nation built on. Honor, integrity, truth, justice, equal rights for everybody. They fought and died for this. And then you guys want to come around and destroy it so that you can become hitmen and, and hired guns for the bankers. Nice job, boys. Great job. Give yourself a big thumbs up. It's going gonna, it's gonna to stop. It's going to stop. And it'll come with education. Now throw in a little passion and, uh, you know, a few other things along the way. And, it, you know, it's going to help too. So if you're knocking on people's door out there that did the OIDs um, and, and attacking them, well, you know, you better, be, you better be careful because you can't handle the truth. Because most of these people, and let's face it, there are a few, there's some of them out there that are using that process strictly for greed and financial gain. Well, okay, then, you know, they're going, to have to, they're going to have to deal with that on their own because that's what they're putting out there. But a few people are doing it because it's the right thing to do and it's the truth. And it's not the bank's money. <laughs> it's their money. And all they did is foreclose on the claim. They, they, they canceled it with a 1099A. And the next thing you knew, uh, apparently, you, you know, they filed the uh, 1099 OID. And they told the truth. Why? Because they're the lender and the bank's the borrower. And you've got the TTNL tracking system inside your old system to prove that. So, you know, you can sit there and say all you want. There are no weeds, there are no weeds, there are no weeds in my garden. Well, guess what? You better go pull them suckers out. <laughs> because if you don't, they'll take over your garden. And there's more people that know the truth than there are agents out there. Because now there are millions of people that are, that are learning this. The genie is out of the bottle. And there's no way you're going to put it back in. You can't stop the truth from permeating across this country. There's nothing you can do about it. You may think you can, but you can't. 
because there's a power great power greater than you going on here. So you might want to think about uh, saving your own ass. Because here's what the bottom line is. The bankers want to kill you first. Why? Because you know too much. And we've already talked to some uh, FBI, or let's just say alphabet personnel, who know that and understand that. And you know what? A lot of you guys are talking in, amongst yourselves because you, know you know it's wrong. You know there's something really, really bad going on, but you don't know what to do. Why? Because you can't walk away from your job. How am I going to tell my family? How am I going to tell my wife? Or how am I going to, if you're an FBI agent and you're a woman, how are you going to tell my husband? By the way, I'm not into women carrying guns. That's not what God put women on this planet for. I don't think so. Of course, most of you are hiding from the truth when it comes to the Lord anyway. So, you know what? But one of these days, like all of us, here's what's one, there's one guarantee on this planet. Um... We're all going to meet the same fate someday. Nobody gets off alive. <laughs> I think Jimmy said that. I love that. You know, no one's going to get off alive. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, when you take your last breath, uh, there's a lot of evidence out there that says that you're going to be standing in front of Jesus. And you've got some explaining to do. I mean, why do so many people come into this, this patriot movement, if you want to call it, or freedom seekers, which uh, I hear Matthew say that. I freaking love that. Freedom seekers and, and truth seekers, because that's really what they are. They're, they're, they've got this unbelievable passion and drive to learn the truth. Um, and that's what it's coming down to be, because you're, you're going to be standing in front of him, whether you like it or not. Now, I learned about the banking industry several years ago, and in in June of 2006, I had to make a very important decision. I had to decide whether I was going to allow the bank to continue to screw me over. Or did I, did I want to say, no, that's it. I'm not taking it. You are not doing this. Um, you're not doing this to me anymore. It's not going to happen. So I demanded to show that they had proof of claim. I got, if you're, if you're an FBI agent or you're a, if you're a federal agent, tell you what, just kind of, you know, you can do this on your own. None of your buddies are going to need to know uh, that you did this. But go ask your bank to prove that they ever owned an equity position in the note. I dare you. Have you got the guts to do that? Go find out for yourself. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Why? Because they never owned an equity position in the note. And the bankers are just going to continue on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And they're not going to stop when they get to your front door. Unless you've got maybe some lamb's blood above your door. And if you don't know what that means, then so be it. Uh, I, I love this thing about you know global warming and this whole Al Gore thing, because that's, that's imploding. <laughs> Al Gore is what, a, what, a, what, an, what an ass, what an ass he is. He lives in Nashville, and his pool house uh, is creating a, 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 a carbon dent uh, larger than most single-family homes. Just his pool house uses more electricity than most three-bedroom, two-bed houses today. And it's interesting that he got the Nobel Prize above the woman in Germany who was working as a, a – uh, uh, she was collecting trash in the streets. And what she did is she hid – uh, kids and got them into the sewer systems and got them out of Nazi Germany. And she got, I, I, I know it's in the thousands, I don't remember exactly how many it was, but she got thousands of children out of Nazi Germany and saved their lives. And she even got some of their names and, and, and were able to trace them and track them later on in life. But oh no, do we give her a Nobel Prize? No, hell no. Let's give one to lion ass Al Gore. Uh, and it's interesting. I remember one time when they interviewed him, and, and they said, gee, Al, you're a, God, you're a man of God. And he's like, oh, yes, I go to church, and I believe, and la da da And they ask him what his favorite scripture verse was. And he said, John 16, 3. Well, I'm not going to tell you what that says tonight. I'm going to ask all of you to go get your Bibles out tonight. Some of you may have to blow a little of the dust off of them, and go look up John 
16.3 and realize what a sense of humor God has. Because obviously all he knew, the only scripture verse he probably even knew was the one that he saw at football games. John 16.3. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But he uh, apparently he might be a tad dyslexic, and he said John 16.3. So go look that up tonight, and you'll get a real chuckle, because it'll tell you exactly where Al Gore's head is in terms of Scripture and his salvation and his relationship with his Creator. So anyway, guys, I'm gonna, I want to kind of wrap it up. We've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, we're going to close the call down tonight at 9.30. Um, uh, I, if, uh, Matthew, if you'll open the call back up, uh, or if, you want, if some of you that are online tonight, you can send a question in. If any of you have any questions, um, again, if you'll put it in a format that would say, if you're going to ask anybody a question in this community, you'd say, hey, uh, John, if it was you and this happened, what would you do? Uh, we always appreciate those, uh, those kind of questions. Um, so anyway, um, if anybody has a, a question that there's a burning desire here and they feel like they're in harm's way by not getting it answered tonight, um, if, you'll, if you want to, Matthew, if you want to let them in or if you see anything, if you want to unmute the, the call or whatever, um, let's take a couple questions if there's anybody on the call tonight that has a question. Adam hit star eight. Okay, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. If you'll, um, if you'll hit star eight. That will unmute you, and you can um, ask a call. So there we go. Any questions tonight? Yes. Can I ask one, one quick question? Absolutely. What's your first name? Uh, Lawrence. Hi, Lawrence. Uh, how you doing? Fabulous. How are you? Great. Hey, the, uh, the information on the TT&L account you were speaking of, how does one uh, research that themselves? Uh, well, we could probably talk for hours about that. Um, you can actually go, uh, you can, it, it, there's a couple different transcripts that you can request uh, from IRS. Um, I'm going to need some help on the number that uh, you can, well, there's a couple things. Number one, you, if you want to track, like let's say your mortgage, uh, one of the things you want to get is a QCIP number. And then um, from there you can, um, I wonder if, my, if our girl uh, teens on the call tonight. She might be able to put the number on here. Um, um, if so, I, I mean, I'm looking for the number that you can request that you can get some of this information. Um, get that's that particular. Go ahead. That's not on the 4506, is it? Um, no, I think that's the. No, hold on a second. Information. Go ahead. Hello. Um, we're we're Tina. We're we're running down. Well, uh, guys, I I hate to uh, I hate to cut the call off tonight, and um, awesome. you know, uh, bring we'll try to get that question answered uh, next week if we can, or if you want to send an email into the person who got you on this call, we'll get you an answer. We actually have another call that we need to get on, ladies and gentlemen. And I apologize for having to, having to cut out, but of course we did announce it at the beginning of the call. Uh, let me just close this down by saying um, you know, a couple words to all of you, and that is we thank you, we appreciate you, and you are loved. Uh, stay out of fear. Stay in love. Come back next week. Uh, we should have some really good information and um, invite some friends. Thanks, everybody. Good night.